Hello, and welcome to the Lowy Institute's Pacific Changemakers, a podcast where we discuss political and development issues with some of the Pacific's most prominent thought leaders. My name is Mihai Sora, and I'm the director of the Australia PNG Network, a Lowy Institute project that aims to build closer ties between Australia and Papua New Guinea. Today, we're very excited to welcome Oliver Nobutau, the new FTC Pacific Fellow for Papua New Guinea, joining the Lowy Institute for a year. We're delving into Oli's personal journey and getting his take as an emerging leader on key national and regional security issues. Oli, welcome. Thanks, Mihai. Thank you for having me on the podcast. I'm really excited to be here and really excited for our chat, uh, as well as the year ahead uh, with Lowy Institute. Brilliant. Let's start from the beginning, Oli. Tell us about your roots and your early influences. Sure. Uh, so I was... I'm from Papua New Guinea. Uh, my father is from the autonomous region of Bougainville. My mother is from West New Britain. Uh, I was born in Germany. My father was a diplomat. Uh, so I spent, I was born in Germany and I did some of my early schooling years in Australia when my father was posted here uh, over in Canberra. I completed my middle school and high school in Papua New Guinea and I went on to obtain my Bachelor of Laws at the University of Papua New Guinea when I graduated uh, in 2019. And what drew you into a career in law? I guess the idea for me was to have a career or a job that really focused on helping people. Uh, at the time, I felt that law was the best career for me to pursue that. Uh, this passion as well, I guess, is one of the underlying issues why I'm also quite keen on the FDC fellowship that I'm a part of now, because I think it promotes a very unique opportunity uh, to contribute uh, not only uh, to the development of the Pacific, but in terms of the literature as well. Uh, I think PNG people and I think Pacific society as a whole, uh, we're naturally orators, so there's not much uh, written history uh, that's in the books for people to access. So being able to contribute to this, uh, to this literature and on, I guess, contemporary issues as well, I think is a unique opportunity, So, which is why I'm pretty excited about that. And after all the many, many years of uh, law school and all of the many, many essays, did you dive straight into a, a job as a lawyer? Yeah, so uh, after attending and obtaining uh, my Bachelor of Laws, I had to go to the Post uh, Graduate Legal Training Institute uh, to get admitted to the bar. That was also in 2019. Shortly after that, I was lucky enough to get a job uh, with the Office of the State Solicitor um, in the Department of Justice and Attorney General back in PNG. This, uh, within OSS, I was uh, attached to the International Law Division, and I dealt primarily with legal matters concerning climate change, uh, national security, but also having the opportunity to work on a broader range of legal issues, uh, such as migration reform, for instance. Uh, sounds like very exciting issues to jump into, particularly for a young lawyer. Can you talk us through some of the highlights, some of the exciting moments in your work, whether it's in climate change or in national security as well? Yeah, sure. I think uh, each each of these areas have their own sort of special set, set of experiences, uh, and I was quite lucky to be able to be exposed to them. Um, I think one of the biggest takeaways is being able to meet uh, with many of the technical, uh, I guess, bureaucrats working in these areas back in the government, uh, very capable people, and you get to learn a lot from them, uh, especially on the technical side of things. Under, um, with climate change, throughout, I guess, my, I think it's a relatively short career, uh, I've been able to assist uh, the Climate Change and Development Authority, uh, the main agency dealing with climate change in the PNG government. Um, I've uh, assisting them with some of the climate initiatives that are in place, such as developing the uh, enhanced nationally determined contributions, uh, which are submitted in 2020 by PNG. Also, attending COP26 in Glasgow, uh, part of the government delegation at the time, giving legal advice to the delegation. Uh, and I was also initially on the team that uh, has been drafting PNG's carbon market regulations, uh, which sort of sets up the domestic uh, regulatory framework for uh, carbon trading. Um, so, and that's in terms of climate change. In terms of the national security, that's a whole sort of different ballgame altogether. Um, I've had the opportunity to deal with some of the security practitioners uh, within the government. So the role that I played uh, as uh, a senior legal officer at the Office of State Solicitor really has you 
putting in input and drafting uh, text bilater for bilateral agreements and arrangements between countries, uh, and also assisting the negotiating teams uh, when it comes to the negotiation of these texts. So some of the highlights, I believe, during the time include the three security arrangements that were entered into between PNG uh, and the United States, for instance, like the 505 agreement, uh, the Shipwright Agreement, and the Defense Cooperation Agreement. More recently as well uh, was the Bilateral Security Agreement uh, between PNG and Australia, which was signed in December last year. I've also been lucky enough to attend some security, some training uh, in, in this area as well, most notably at the Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies. I attended a course in 2022 and was lucky enough to get invited back uh, to play a facilitating role as a seminar leader, an alumni seminar leader, sorry, um, in the first iteration of the course in 2023. Um, but in the security space, there's a, there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of opportunity to do many different things. Uh, one of the highlights, I think, as well, which is a pretty fun story, was during the 2021 riots in Solomon Islands, uh, the PNG police was going to get deployed uh, to Solomon Islands, and it required, I guess, to, an ex uh, to the extent that my role provided um, uh, sort of an arrangement in place between <clears throat> both countries uh, to enable the deployment uh, of the PNG police, and one time we had we had to go and visit uh, Solomon Islands, and we got on. It was myself and some other government officials. I guess I won't name them here, but um, we got on a small little six-seater plane uh, that was being flown by Tropic Air, and then we flew from Port Moresby to Honiara. And I remember vividly, sort of uh, seeing the views at the time. We were, there was smoke that was sort of blowing into the air. When we landed, there was nobody. On the runway, uh, nobody was at work, so we just sort of had to land and figure out where to go, um, uh, sort of where to park the plane, really. Uh, so we we got there, and then we met with the officials that we needed to meet to within a couple of hours, and then we flew out again. So that was sort of a, a bit of a little surreal experience as well, but uh, really an opportunity that presented itself because of the work that we were doing at the time. Yeah, quite a dramatic story. So... Uh, what did it feel like flying over Honiara? You would have seen some of the some of the imagery that we've seen in the media, you know, burning buildings and um, uh, scenes of scenes of uh, people running about in different directions. What was it like when you guys were uh, were landing, were arriving in Honiara? Yeah, I think uh, it was pretty much the same. You know, I, I recall flying over and seeing a building on fire, smoke going through the air, and it was just sort of right next to us where we're about to land land the plane. The streets are relatively empty. Um, I think most of the fighting had uh, already taken place. And prior to us landing, there was an New Guinea flight uh, with PNG police personnel that had gone to sort of secure the area. Uh, so it was quite, it was, it was relatively quiet uh, by the time that we arrived there. So, but it was, it was definitely uh, some unique scenes that you don't usually see. So between climate change and regional security, You've had the privilege of working on some of the most important issues in our region today. What are the topics, what are the themes that you're most passionate about? Well, thanks. Um, I think in terms of what I'm most passionate about, it tends to stem, I'm heavily influenced uh, by the work that I did um, in OSS, um, and that's to do with climate change and, and, and security. So I guess, you know, while I'm here during the fellowship, I plan to conduct research in these areas. For climate change, particularly in terms of climate-induced migration, um, I think that's a real issue, and sort of examining uh, the government policies and strategies that are in place to deal with uh, persons who are displaced because of climate change. Uh, this has already happened in PNG on the ground uh, in Bougainville with the Carteret Islands. And there are different challenges that are unique to each country. For example, uh, in PNG, the complexity of the land tenure system, it, it makes it, 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 in, it introduces a bit of a barrier, which uh, has to be an obstacle that has to be overcome when you're thinking of relocating people, because the land is owned by the traditional custodians of the land. It's not as simple as getting people and relocating them to a separate place. So it has to be, it, if not managed well, it could be a potential for um, conflict or social issues um, uh, that need to be managed well by the governments. Mm. 
And how has the issue of climate change affected you personally? I think in terms of my personal experience, I sort of grew up mainly in the urban areas and I would go back uh, to the rural, to my uh, villages where my parents are from. Um, not that often, but when you do, you get to notice that there are many differences to the environment when you go back. For instance, some of the creeks or watering holes that you would uh, enjoy sort of swimming in when you were younger, start to get smaller. And I'd, I guess that sort of happens too when you gain weight and get a little bit bigger. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but, you know, they, they tend to dry up. Some, we're having some of those problems where they're drying up. Um, as, as well as with the food, you enjoy a lot of food that you have fond memories of like when you're, when you're younger. And as you get older, uh, some of those crops are just not growing as well as they used to. One of the biggest things too that I sort of take away from this is that the phenomena of climate change is it's observable by people in the rural areas and they can see what's going on. The unfortunate thing is without, I guess, the proper awareness, um, they don't know how to address it, how to deal with it. Um, and sort of, and you know, more importantly, how to adapt to the changing climate to ensure that their livelihood is preserved as well. So, it's it's something that I care deeply about, and this is why I want to, I guess, delve more into the research around this area. Of course, and climate change for so many communities, as you say, it's a lived experience. And what's really important is to be able to connect those communities with data, with access to policies, to decision makers, to international efforts as well um, that put pressure on governments to, to take more ambitious positions and identify how to mitigate or, or relieve the problems in those communities. Absolutely. Uh, tell me a bit more about your interest in security, the other half of your of your career so far. Yeah, so security as well, it sort of, uh, it sort of follows the same track for me. Um, my interest in it really spurred from the work that I was exposed to and I really got to understand security as an issue, um, as something of prominence and national security, I guess, to that degree when I got to work with some of the security practitioners in the government. So I think what's needed in this area is to engage in more dialogue um, on security threats and the issues that we face, because it's getting more complex. It's no longer just traditional security threats. There are non-traditional security threats, for instance, uh, climate security, economic security, internal security uh, as well, uh, which, which is something that needs to be managed uh, by governments, but people need to be aware of. So I hope to sort of contribute to a deeper understanding of that um, and also how cooperation, not just within government domestically, but regional cooperation as well, can help to try and address these threats and mitigate these threats. Uh, I guess I also have an interest in Bougainville because my father, like I mentioned, is from the autonomous region of Bougainville. So I'm hoping to contribute to the literature around that and the thinking around that. Um, I think that there's large potential for, I guess, its social and economic future. And that needs to be managed, noting the history that's behind um, what's happened on Bougainville. I think this needs to be properly managed and uh addressed in a manner which prevents the further conflict from taking place as well. And yeah, so I mean, back home, there are different ways, I guess, that we can contribute, I guess, in development as well. Uh, myself and a few colleagues uh, have gotten together and sort of in the process of incorporating an association that can sort of provide the platform for younger professionals that are from Bougainville to assist and carry out some projects back home which contribute to development uh, and so I guess I guess that's sort of the work that I'll be doing but through a different uh, range of mediums hopefully like a podcast dialogue some more articles under the interpreter as well um, so yeah there's a there's a lot to talk about here and bringing it back home for for a minute we saw some terrible scenes of unrest in Port Moresby in January this year now, you were still living in Port Moresby at the time. What was that like for you as, as a resident, as a young person, as a future leader of, of Papua New Guinea? Uh, yeah, to be honest, it was, it was definitely surreal. It was something that was unprecedented that hasn't been experienced before. If I could describe the feeling uh, during the unrest, I think it was quite tense. It was unsettling. Uh, I guess there was a bit of a sense of a feeling of hopelessness at some stage, especially on the first day, because I think the realization was setting in to a lot of people that, you know, there was 
an absence of, I guess, law enforcement and civil authority. So you couldn't rely really on anyone to keep the peace. And it was sort of like an every man for themselves uh, mentality. Uh, so, you know, I guess the, the impact on the community, there were people, I guess it was a traumatic experience for everyone. And there are some people who suffered, you know, losses personally. I really feel for the business community um, that suffered majority of the loss, uh, the damage that was done to their infrastructure. I think the numbers that have been uh, quoted recently are that they would require around 358 million kina, I guess, to restock and rebuild uh, their businesses. So they've, they've suffered a lot um, in terms of that. A lot of jobs have been lost as well. The perception of government... Um, after after the unrest, the narrative that was developing for a long time was not something that was quite, you know, in my view, in a positive light. And I don't think the management uh, of the of the unrest is something that helped the perceptions of people in the government. I can, you know, you can appreciate that it's not a very easy task to deal with. Um, but I guess, you know, the government has done what it can do, you know, um, uh, but people, I don't know. The general sense is that people aren't too happy with how it was being managed. Um, and if we consider, I guess, the effect of the unrest and the trajectory of the country, there was a lot of optimism when we started off the year with a lot of the projects that seem to be coming online, one of the main ones as well. Within the first quarter, it was anticipated that Pogara would come back online. Uh, but I don't I don't think that these the unrest will essentially prevent the projects from taking place but the trajectory of it has definitely been affected and it may be a deterrent for i guess new investment uh into the into the country but only time will tell uh another issue as well i guess we consider is the social trajectory because i guess at the end of the day the destruction was caused by people and not you know it wasn't like a natural disaster or an act of god or anything like that so i guess that's a cause for concern as well i think socially people need to start looking at what we can do to address that and sort of turn that, I mean, use this to turn this into more of a po positive direction socially. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. Um, now, Oli, you were in Canberra last week um, for Prime Minister James Marape's state visit. Uh, you attended a state dinner. You witnessed uh, Prime Minister Marape's historic address to the Australian Parliament. Um, and you had a chance to get up close and personal with Prime Minister Marape, and you even had a brief chat with him. Now, it's quite rare for a young person to be able to speak directly to their national leader. Tell us what that was like. Yeah, so it was, it was, it was, it was a very fun experience. It was my first week at Lowy, um, so it was quite jam-packed as well. So they had, the, they had the, the dinner that was hosted by Prime Minister Albanese on the Wednesday night, the address uh, to government, um, on the Thursday morning and then the ANU address uh, as well on the night. So the dinner was quite fancy as well. I think it was one of the fanciest <laughs> things that I've been to. <laughs> I mean, you were there. <laughs> uh, so I think, yeah, I think it was, I think it was a great, um, I think it was a great event. Uh, definitely the feeling in the room was that it wasn't, it didn't seem too official. I think there was some, there was a bit of a warmth in the atmosphere and it just felt like it really speaks to the relationship that exists between Australia and PNG. Um, the parliamentary address as well, I think, was delivered quite well by the Prime Minister, regardless of whatever the opinions that people may have of him. Um, I think it's important not to take away that this is a historic moment between both countries. And I think the Prime Minister did a good job uh, in addressing the parliament, not as a prime minister, but like, as he mentioned, the chief servant or as the mouthpiece uh, for a nation. And I think it's really elevated the the relationship between both states as, a, as sovereigns uh, to the highest degree. Um, so what I mean, when I got to have a chat with him as well after his annual address, he was, he was very nice. I think what struck me the most is that he's quite approachable. Um, I think he's, I mean, we had two chats with him. We had one chat first and then we were able to circle back again and then talk to him once more. Uh, so I think what struck me the most is that he was very approachable. When I first saw him, he was chatting with, I, I believe, UPNG students who are currently doing like some exchange program with ANU. Um, so yeah, I think I think he was very nice. Uh, he was kind about you know just openly having a chat. So it was it was, it was a good experience. Yeah. And how important do you think the prime minister's visit was to progress the relationship between Australia and Papua New Guinea? I think it's I think it is quite significant. Um, 
you know, especially when you consider sort of what's at play, um, I guess domestically, the politics there are, are really kicking up and for him to be taking, you know, uh, taking up the invitation and visiting during sort of such a time, I think it speaks to how he views the importance of the re of relationship between Australia and PNG. And I, I would like to think that this is something that has really cemented um, the, the relationship between both countries as well. What I would like to see, I guess, is to possibly, if we could have this be a recurring sort of uh, event, maybe once every decade or so, to sort of just, uh, to sort of reinvigorate the, the bilateral relations and cooperation between both Australia and PNG. And it'd be great to get invited again to the state dinner, I'm sure. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, the food is pretty good. <laughs> Now, you know, stepping back a little bit, um, there's certainly a lot happening in Papua New Guinea. The year kicked off with some unpleasant scenes of violence. There was loss of life. Um, there are political fluctuations. There's rapid progress on bilateral security agreements, big regional issues coming up. Climate change is, is approaching as a regional issue as well as um, Australia seeking to host a, a COP meeting with Pacific Island leaders. There's a lot of flux in the region. Um, and people sometimes say when they when they look at Papua New Guinea and its trajectory that it's difficult to stay optimistic when you think of the scenes of violence, reports of corruption, uh, and, and generally the tough conditions that people live under in the country. How do you stay optimistic as a young Papua New Guinean? Yeah, I think uh, yeah, what, you're, what you're saying is right. And I think one of the best ways to stay optimistic is to have hope. Um, which is very, it, it's, it's a lot easier said than done, I guess, in the circumstances. But I think at the moment, the younger people and the younger generation that are sort of coming up are very much more aware of the issues that are going on. And they have access to abundance of resources uh, to assist them in figuring out how to fix the problems and to sort of change the trajectory that we're, go that we're sort of currently on. I think it requires... And the way that I guess I would stay optimistic is you need to also recognize that it's not something that's going to be fixed by one person, but it's going to be fixed when everybody decides to work together, not only as individuals, but I think across all sectors. Uh, so if you think about government, uh, civil society, private sector as well, I think we all have a role to play in contributing to how this, con uh, this country recovers and the trajectory that we're on. Um, so yeah, so I think that's, it's one thing to, I, yeah, sorry, I think we need to learn to sort of cooperate with each other, but also get very creative, understand the systems that are in place and get creative in figuring out how we can solve the issues. And we need to have a clear vision of where we want to go. Uh, and then from that point on, we can start making the steps and taking the necessary steps to sort of move towards, um, I guess, the PNG and the potential uh, that we have there. I believe the actions that are happening now are not necessarily uh, detrimental to the amount of potential that we have, but it is detrimental to uh, the manner in which uh, all the opportunities that we currently have available to actually uh, tap into this potential that we have. Um, I think it's also very important to note that a lot of the times, PNG is, uh, there's just a large number of internal issues that we always deal with. And thinking of things at the national level, international level, cooperation is also very necessary. We can't fix our problems ourselves. And I think we need to always be open to assistance and learning from other countries as well. And there are people who want to come and assist us in this sense. And I guess this is this would be a good time to to sort of draw back on the significance of the relationship between Australia and PNG with what just happened. Um, I think Australia has shown that it ha it is a very competent and trusted partner uh, throughout the years. PNG is still um, the largest aid recipient um, of Australian aid money as well. You know, so I think we have to realize that yeah, we can't fix the problems ourselves, um, but I think we should be open to a lot of regional cooperation um, in dealing with the issues that we face sort of on the ground. Uh, I recall Prime Minister Marape's remarks. Among the things he said was, uh, for Australia, contribute where you can, leave the rest to us, uh, and hope is such a precious commodity. So. Oliver Nobatow, thank you for sharing some of that hope with us today. Thank you for sharing your story and, and giving us your time. 
I'm Mihai Sora, director of the AusPNG Network at the Lowy Institute. This episode of Pacific Changemakers was produced by Josh Godding. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to joining you for the next episode. Thank you.